You're listening to the NBA Wire, and this is episode number 32. Uh, which is better to follow, your heart or your head? I'd say my heart, because your head can, you know, it allows you to lie to yourself. Your heart is never going to lie to you. Never going to lie to you. Follow your heart. Let's hit it. Inspirational MBA talk with successful alumni to motivate you during your application run. We go behind the scenes of every story, talk business, and show you why it's worthwhile to never give up on your MBA dream. And now, here's your host with the most, Matteo Chang. What's up, citizens of The Wire? Welcome back to yet another episode. Thanks for tuning in. In today's episode, I am here speaking with Subu Vishwanathan, right? I hope I didn't... That's right. Awesome, awesome. Uh, but for the record, uh, Subu, why don't you go ahead and tell us your full name so our listeners can know how to, <laughs> <laughs> how to pronounce right. it. Yeah. yeah, my full name goes like this. Subramanian Kalpati Vishwanathan. Beautiful. But easily put, my friends call me Subu. Subu. Okay. Subar or Superman is, is your nickname. Yeah. For, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. At times people get confused with Subramanian and Superman. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Subu, uh, thank you so much for making uh, your time available for us here just to kind of talk about your MBA journey and your experience as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, we just want to thank you so much. Uh, why don't you go ahead and mm-hmm. uh, start off our conversation by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing recently and some cool stuff. All right. First of all, thanks, uh, Matthew. Thanks for inviting me into this. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to, uh, for me also to talk about uh, my MBA journey. So I am uh, Subu, as I said. I am, and I'm doing my MBA with, I should say, Paris. Uh, so it's a 16-month program, so there is no first year, second year. So I'm graduating in June 2016. And as we speak now, I am currently in my internship with Amazon in the UK. So before coming to HEC, I have worked for almost nine years. I have worn the hat of a manager, of a consultant, of a technology evangelist. I've taken multiple roles. I've worked in the Middle East and in India. In my last job, I was uh, kind of managing the information security function for a bank in Kuwait. So that's a bit about me. Wow, wow. Okay, any favorite hobbies or things you like to do on your free time? Yes, I love to travel. As of now, I'm okay, I wouldn't call a major traveler, but as of now, I've crossed around 22 countries. I am also a a little bit fanatic on adventure sports. So I do things like uh, scuba, skydiving, or uh, bungee jumping, and those kind of stuff. I love them, yeah. Nice, man. Bungee jumping, extreme sports, huh? A bit, yes. I'm still uh, maturing on that. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, have you, speaking of which, I, I was watching these. I was seeing these videos of the very first uh, uh, um, um, jump and release bungee jumping. Like you actually hold on to the cord, you bungee mm-hmm. jump, and then when, mm-hmm. once you're ready to go, you just let go and then fall into the river or whatever is underneath you. <laughs> have you? Is that? Have you seen that? Yeah, I have seen that video, yeah. But fortunately, I've never fallen. So uh, not yet, the, rope, the ropes were strong yet. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. right. All right, that's... That's an adventurous, uh, an adventurous thing to do if you're in the mood for something crazy. But uh, I want to get yeah. back to your Amazon internship. Now, tell me about that because I am, like I told you before, mm-hmm. I, I am uh, an Amazon addict. I think I think I buy stuff uh, mm-hmm. just because, you know, I don't know. It's, it's just a compelling. It's just, I don't know. It's compulsive. You know, mm-hmm. these, these, these <laughs> online e-commerce websites, man, they just get me. They send me these discount stuff and I don't even need it. And then I just like, all right, I'm going to buy it. And then I have my friend, <laughs> you know, just return it or something if I'm not using it. So but tell okay. me about your internship. Uh, so I am in the operations uh, department of Amazon. So I basically work in a fulfillment center here. So I work on a project because I'm an MBA intern and uh, what we basically do is try to improve the current operational processes. Basically, if, for example, you are a customer, right? If you're a prime member, you want your stuff to be delivered in one day. So how best can we do that for you? That's one of the things. It's, it's amazing. The, the processes and stuff, it's like 
super crazy out here and I'm, it's a new experience for me as well i've never worked in operations before so as an mba graduate it's it's kind of interesting to apply what you learn back in school to see what is actually happening in reality the chaos and then how you deal with it it's interesting Huh. And how did you get this operations uh, internship then? Like, I mean, were you recruited or what did you do to get this internship? So Amazon is uh, one of the premier recruiters from, I should say, and uh, we apply. And then there is a formal interview process, which is like four rounds of interview with uh, some of the GMs and other people. And if you crack it, you're in for an internship. It, it's, it's the same interview process for uh, full time as well. Huh. Okay, so what, what, I mean, like, uh, what are the what's the, what are the steps of getting recruited? Then, I mean, if you can just enlighten uh, us with some brief, uh, with a brief summary of what 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 kind of process do you go through? Okay, so it's basically four rounds of interviews with Amazon. So they basically test you on your past experience. They would prefer people who have got uh, past experience. Experience need not be directly related to operations or product management. They basically evaluate your skills with the 16 core principles of Amazon. So the if you kind of match those leadership principles, then you're basically recruited with Amazon. And the process goes like this, they have like four interviews and each of the four interview by itself is a decision maker. So if any one guy says no, then it's a, it's a gone. And they also have something called as a bar raiser. So what typically a bar raiser means is he will be one of the senior guys from Amazon who would interview you. And the idea is to recruit people who are technically better than 50% of the staff at that particular grade. So if you get into a bar raiser interview, that's that's going to be one of the toughest challenges. So the, the, the interview is going to grill you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can imagine how grilling it for four interviews. You know, and if you get one no, then it's kind of like it's kind of like the uh, um, you know, like Britain's Got Talent. You know, if you get one X, <laughs> you're out. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's very d- difficult for me to say how I got it in or how my colleagues got it in. It, it was more of a pretty interesting conversations that you have. You share your experiences with them, and then it kind of happens. Yeah, and I I had no clue after any of the interviews whether I'm in or not. It was very confusing. So you, you never know. I think one of my interviews was a bar racer. So he was like grilling me for almost half an hour. Wow. Wow. Made you sweat right there you know, on the spot. Almost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Good. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So it, it, why did you choose HEC Paris? I was there actually during a conference uh, just a few months ago. It is very mm-hmm. nice. Uh, apart from the fact that, you know, you're only about half an hour away from Paris. Right mm-hmm. and, and, and mm-hmm. man, France is just amazing. I loved it. Um, what are what were your reasons for choosing HEC Paris? Okay, so uh, okay, let me start about before HEC Paris. Why MBA? Like, I thought about an MBA almost when I was twenty two, twenty three. That was like seven, eight years back. And then I wanted to do an MBA from a school which has got a very diverse population. So I was kind of looking at different schools, which is well reputed, probably in the top 20s in the world. And that's how I decided that I am going to do my MBA from a European school, mainly because of the diversity aspect of it. And then when I looked at another uh, couple of parameters that I had was uh, I wanted a class that is of manageable size. I didn't want to be in a place where you have like 700, 800 people and you don't get to interact with the other person. Networking was very, very important for me. Networking, not in terms of pure networking for the sake of it, but to make real good friends or lifelong friends, you could say. And then another parameter for me was uh, considering the number of years that I've already spent in the industry, I wanted to get back to the industry. So consulting, initially I thought maybe consulting was also an option. Then I kind of figured out that industry would be the best fit option for me. So looking at all those things, I kind of uh, zeroed in a couple of schools. And one of the school is, I should say, wherein the class strength is pretty normal. It's like 130 to 140 of which we have around 44 different nationalities in our batch. If we take consider the Jan intake as well, then it goes to almost 51, which is pretty diverse set of people. So that was something very exciting for me. And I should see also had 
was kind of ranked the number one in terms of networking, which was something which I wanted. And I could vouch for that, like the kind of uh, networking means like the, the responsiveness of the alumni community or even the friends. Right. That's pretty amazing so far that people are really, really helpful and supportive of each other. Yeah. So that's how I kind of narrowed in and I applied and thankfully I got in. Yeah. Now, what was what, what was the hardest part of your journey like to to apply? To shortlist a school which wherein I would be a good fit and the school would be a good fit for me. It should be a mutual match. So I didn't want to get into the rat race, but at the same time, I wanted to get into something which is from where I can take a real good value addition into what I've been thinking in my life. Hmm. Wait, no. So, and yes, yeah, go ahead, go not, ahead. To, for, not to forget finance was definitely another point of consideration. Finance. Okay. Now, a lot yeah. of students talk about fit, and, and that's actually one of the questions like during the MBA interviews, and everybody throws that word around, fit, fit, fit. What, yeah. in your opinion, would be like, f what does that mean? What does it mean to have a fit with the school? It means that uh, what you, okay, let me put it very, very simple. Let me not give like the high fund uh, things that what people say. Basically, uh, the cohort that is coming in in the school, they should be able to gel well together. So the thought process of people should be pretty similar. Like if you are going into a consulting or a, uh, not even forget, forget even job but even the aggressiveness those kind of things matters a lot if you look at the school where we're coming from like most of the people want to have be in a very diverse environment most of the people wanted to interact with multicultural people and try to figure out the other person's perspective so you can actually feel that when you go into the school like the first whole month i would say even first two three months we were like partying every other day, partying not for the sake of partying. We were like going to the other person's room. Everybody would come to your room. It was a total interaction. Everybody was so eager to understand about the other person, to understand about a different culture altogether. So it was fun. And I could see a lot of people with the same wavelength. And people were not so aggressive. People were kind of competitive, but not aggressive. Do you see what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. There was a certain openness and embracing, uh, you know, exactly. everyone was embracing each other's cultural differences exactly. and was eager to learn. Exactly, exactly. So that was probably that, that's what people call as fit. Hmm. Hmm. If you're not probably in that loop, then probably you would be, and uh, you would be the black sheep. Yeah, you'd be the guy alone in his room studying. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and yeah, de exactly. declining all social events. So, exactly. Yeah. And even in, even uh, one thing which I noticed, even when people are hunting for jobs, right? So if we come across an interesting opportunity, we share it with people. We don't have uh, the feeling that, oh my God, what if that guy takes my job? Mm -hmm. You know, that was never there. I've not seen that kind of an attitude at all. But in, I've heard such kind of attitude from other places. Maybe it's the competitiveness or it is the, I don't know, it's the approach. What other difficulties did you face there? Like, I mean, apart from your, your shopping list, uh, did you face mm -hmm. any difficulties like with the GMAT or, or anything in the process? Where it, was there a moment where you were like, should I really do, I mean, do, do I really want this? Or, or did you not have that? Were you focused the entire way through? Uh, personally, I was kind of focused because this was a four or five year dream for me where I was working towards it. Yeah, GMAT was tough, so, but it was okay. It was, I think it was okay. It was okay. Nice. So it was like your determination from the beginning, you know, that you set it out, you stretched it out four to five years to reach your goals. And even, even when you got hit with the challenges, you, you pushed through them and overcame them. True, true, true. Nice. This was kind of the ultimate uh, motto that I wanted to do it when I had eight years of work in the industry and it just got extended by one more year. What was the driving force for that? I mean, like, how did you really do? Because I mean, some people, you know, start off strong, start off, you know, hot, and then it, they just kind of wear down. And at one point, you know, they're like, they question themselves. How did, were you able to keep that fire alive inside of you? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, let, 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 me, let, <laughs> let me just take a second to think about that. Sure. Probably, take your time. I don't know, I applied with uh, McKinsey once and I got rejected. They said, your profile is good, but you're not from a great school. So I wanted that pedigree in me. So, so when, when my friends uh, 
ask me um, uh, a question like uh, they, they tell me like why do you want to do an MBA you're already doing good in life then I say it is not just about what you're doing now it's about what you're going to be doing 10 years down the line it's about the kind of people that you're going to meet so I always wanted to meet with probably I mean people whom I consider better than me yeah. so I always wanted that so I wanted to go to a premier institute where I could get that opportunity it's funny because you, you you mentioned that and it reminded me of this this one speaker who said you know for example let's take a let's take a prominent school and you know you, you're you're a top student uh getting into this uh, trying to get into this school and once you hit that school you realize you're just average you know it's like everyone around you is just as brilliant or even more exactly than you are exactly but, but during that process yeah and you end up learning from each other and and you all kind of you all kind of gel into this this group that that becomes uh, 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 a lifelong friendship and a lifelong network of people who you can count on, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. True that. True that. Totally. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's very nice. That's awesome. So, I mean, keeping that in focus, I bet, fueled your determination. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's great. Now, while you're, you, you know, while you're here at HEC Paris, what are some of the things that have been really just outstanding, like really made it worth it? You know, what what really make you what are the things that make you like feel joyful about your experience? OK, so I would say the amount of opportunities that HEC presented in front of me was like phenomenal. Like we could we could just choose what, what we want to do. For example, I was taking uh, I was the president for the industry club which kind of gave me an opportunity to go and explore, talk to different uh, industries, industries, companies in the world. When people kind of respond to you, that was a great experience altogether and leading that club and focusing club club, club related activities. Another major thing that I would say was MBAT. So we, and I should say we organized MBAT, where over 1,500 students from across the European schools come in, B-school students come in. And it's a three day sporting event. So it's almost a million euro project by itself. So and it's 100 percent student run. Yes. So three days of madness, six months of preparation was like mind blowing. That was a great, great, great experience. And yeah, that's something which is a great takeaway for me. And another thing would be the kind of friends that I've made. That's like really, really good. And the interaction with uh, the folks here has probably made me a little more matured as an individual than what I was a couple of years back. Nice. You know, uh, every every European school student I, I've spoken with, like uh, HEC, INSEAD, uh, London Business School, they always talk about the MBAT. And, you know, if, about eight episodes ago, I think it was in 23, I interviewed... Uh, Chris McAvoy, which was the president or the head. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, is he yeah, still yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris, 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 Chris is my bad. So he was uh, he was heading events and uh, I was working with him and I was managing the bars. <laughs> ah, okay. Wow. Small world, so me, man. Me, yeah. So me, me and Chris uh, worked pretty closely and pretty hard for MBAT. Oh, fantastic! Well, if you can send him a, you know, send him a hug for me from Brazil, that would be great. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I'll definitely do that. Yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. So yeah, because the MBAT sounds so amazing. I mean, there's just so many different types of sports, you know, from go karting to I don't know, synchronized, synchronized swimming. I, no, I don't think there's synchronized <laughs> swimming, but I'm sure that any yeah. kind of sport, a fun, yeah, exciting. We sport had like can... 26 sporting events, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Oh, wow. Who was the overall champion this year? Uh, it was London Business School, and we came second. We lost by half a point. Oh. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I think the judges stole that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, I, have, I, have, I have London Business School students, you know, who, who you know, get, there's a big rivalry amongst you guys, right? But it's a healthy rivalry. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is definitely a healthy rivalry. And I was actually, I was speaking to some of the guys from LBS, and they were like, you know what, the seats for MBAT open up, and they have like around 200 slots available and it gets over within three minutes or something like that. Jeez, in three I was minutes. Like, I was like, jeez, are you kidding me? You guys have to like 
go it's it's like getting a wimbledon ticket out here in the uk <laughs> yeah. yeah it is <clears throat> wow i, I mean uh, not only is it hard but do you guys even have like do you guys sell spectator tickets like people who want to watch <clears throat> no we don't sell uh, spectator tickets we uh it's uh, the the pricing is for the schools we have sponsors we have advertising we have the bar which is one of the major revenue generator uh-huh. yeah that's how we make money uh, and each right. participating school has to pay for the number of students who's coming in so wow yeah cuz i mean this sounds like it sounds like you know you guys are nearing the fame of a madonna concert or u2 concert <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three minutes, man, to sell out. That's that's pretty amazing. That's insane. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I might be wrong with the number, but it's in very small digits of minutes. Yes. Yeah. What did you? What sport did you participate in? Uh, I could participate only in cricket. Cricket. Because uh, yeah, because I was managing the bars. We had like four bars: three uh-huh. in the morning, one in the night. So my day was from morning eight a.m. until night. 4 a.m. so three four hours of sleep, not much energy left behind to play sports. <laughs> true, true, NASA. Yeah, because yeah, you have to you have to focus on studying and getting your grades there first. Yeah. Right? <laughs> how do you how do you manage your time, man? I mean, how do you prioritize? Like, okay, you have your school, you have your social events, you know, you have to network, you have all these great yeah. stuff going on, and then you have the parties. What's you know? Because I mean, there's one. It's one thing to go to a party. It's another thing to have a dinner party, you know, with friends and stuff, but. You know, how does that work? How do you manage your time? Because I know it's like nonstop, you know, uh, as soon as you wake up, you're immersed in the school until you go to sleep. How do you True. juggle all that? Uh, well, uh, that's what probably everybody tries to figure out. Is It's based on the priorities. For example, I mean, it's virtually impossible to be everywhere. So you need to prioritize as in what you want to do probably for the week. And even before taking up responsibilities we need to be very sure that we can commit and devote so much of time for example like uh, if if uh, for mbat if i take up the responsibility of managing the bar rest assured that you're not going to party true so yeah so that's that's a choice like if you want to uh, go for some sports then you need to put in that effort to take that up and i mean everybody kind of figure out their own Wishes like the I've heard uh, in HSA we have free uh, golf and free horse riding and stuff. I've I've not got the time to do that, so that was a conscious choice. I was like, okay, I don't have time for that. Even though that opportunity is there, I cannot go there. But there are others who go for that, who really like and enjoy that. So you'd have to be much more selective of the things that you. You have to be very very selective. If you put your hands on ten things, then you're gonna be in a soup. I think most of us kind of figure it out by. The first core, because first core, it's it's a total excitement. Everybody want to do everything, and I think in the first core, I slept for hardly three to five hours every day because <laughs> there was so much of activities. I was doing student <laughs> ambassador. I was doing, I was a student uh, representative. Then I was a part of the <laughs> wow. council, and oh, I was it was crazy. It was really really crazy. Yeah. So and then you kind of get to slow down by the second year, second core, you kind of figure out, okay, fine, these are things I want to do and these are things probably I'll just give it a pass. <laughs> yeah. How did you manage through that? Like three to five hours a night, did you not break down at some point, at some point or were you just like, did you push it through until, until you know, uh, some break came and then slept through the break? I mean, there were some days where you just pass out on the weekend, like Sundays are like, sleep the whole day <laughs> so you kind of make it make up for that <laughs> yeah yeah Re- recharge but, but it was tough yeah kind of recharge oh man i yeah. can only imagine but I, it's fun it's fun now it was fun it was really fun it was really good fun oh yeah oh yeah i bet it's uh i bet it's amazing you know and uh one of the things that i was curious about did you do that uh hcc uh leadership uh the leadership boot camp in sunshine yeah, yeah we did how is that yeah. oh that was what oh how can i forget it? that was yet another what do you call star event in the entire mba program yeah so yeah that was uh, two days of amazing experience so we are we will be taken to the military camp in uh, in france and there are group exercises individual exercises that's where you can actually see people 
cracking down under pressure. For example, like we had to build a bridge, hmm. right? Brick and mortar. You have to actually make X bridges and cross a river. And you could actually see who, how many people are coming in, taking that initiative to get the pr- bridge up and run. When things are not working, you could see teams like going haywire. So it was a great. <laughs> and yeah, the best part was the the feedback that the military people give you. So it's so amazing to see some of your own strengths and weaknesses coming out. Wow. So in that real was really, time, really, like really in, good. In the real, yeah, in real time. Yeah. Now, yeah. To build a bridge, they instruct you on how to build a bridge, or they already just like build a bridge, cross the river. No, you know, and you don't have any okay. architects there who have no idea what they're so, doing. Okay, so for building the bridge part, uh, the guys give us like ten minutes of demo, as in how you make an X and how you make the second X. So you just see that once in ten minutes, and then we're good to go. A crash course. It's a crash course. Yeah. Wow. So it, it depends. It's, it's totally teamwork. So uh, you need to be able to break down who's going to do what, who's going to tie the excess, who's going to lift it, who's going to take a rotation, who's going to sit and watch and see whether everything is going fine, if something is going wrong, how to take things back. So it you have to really split the work. It's a lot of effort and it's around 10 people in a team, 10 to 12 people in a team. Yeah. Any conflicts? Like- so, Oh yeah, yeah, lot, lot of conflicts come at times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet so, the, I bet yeah. the fists flew a few times. Here and there. Oh yeah, man, yeah, yeah. so it depends. Like, uh, so it depends on the team as well, right? So you could see that, like, some some teams getting really, really frustrated because they're not able to do it. Some teams are like super cool because they already know somebody who has made a bridge before, and they're like, tuck, 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 tuck. they've gone. People have started crossing. The interesting part is like when half way reaches then the people who are not able to make it up to speed how they maintain their composure is pretty interesting similar to that we had another one where you had to actually make a boat with what? some empty uh, stuff and then you have to cross a river so you have some rope you have some basic raw materials you need to tie tie everything up build a uh, build a boat and 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 you need to make sure that all the people go from one shore to the other that that was also pretty interesting well, now, now explain to me, how does this apply to a business school or a business setting? So, yeah, there are a few things in that. One is when you are, like, for each of these tasks, a person is appointed as a leader, right? So the leader should be able to subdivide the task and manage the task properly. He should be able to identify who is the right talent for a particular job. It is not about, I like you, so you come and do everything with me. You should be able to kind of figure out. So some of the things you don't initially know, right? So you talk to people, you kind of understand what they need, what they can do, what they what they cannot do, what they're comfortable, and then you split the teams. And each team, you need to be able to supervise and monitor independently, and you should also be willing to give responsibility to other people. Because you so when like building a bridge or building a boat and crossing things, you cannot be there everywhere so you need to assign people to do those kind of things and during the individual assignments what you kind of see is how you you as an individual can over, overcome some of your fears and how you can be a motivation factor for the other person to overcome his fears so it's 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 kind of very very interesting like and the kind of feedback that the guys give is also pretty interesting like for example one of the things the the feedback that I got uh, was uh, the the major was like, you are a strong man, you're there, you're active in the field, you are a good field leader, but you should also at times take a step back to keep the bird's eye view intact, which was which was true. So when, when I was in action, I was totally in action. I was like in as a part of the crowd, but mm-hmm. I should have, if I had taken a couple of steps back and looked at things from a bird's eye perspective, I could have done better. Right. So when I did it for the next task, things were totally different. And that's something which I will never forget in my life. Wow. What a what a strong takeaway, especially for like a leadership uh, position and to learn how to work in a team. I think that's 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 very admirable. I mean, that is it's, it's applicable because it's it's you know, you're you're putting people in a completely a surreal situation. <laughs> you know, I don't think, True. you know, when am I going to be crossing a river? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, unless it's on a bridge already in a car. But, mm-hmm. you know, when do I need to build a bridge? And then, you know, you have that aspect and you bring it in together to teach each other how to be a leader. That's great. I mean, especially on being able to apply that to, you know, your work at, you know, while you're doing the MBAT, organizing the MBAT, and then your future work True. back in consulting. Yes? True. True. Wow. That's nice. That's nice. Now, I was I was put in contact with you through Prodigy Finance. What's your relationship with Prodigy? Have you, were you, are you, have you, uh, uh, been you know have you used are you using their services or i am using their services and i'm strongly advocating that to some of my friends as well in fact a couple of people who have got in uh oxford i've already told them that you should and one guy from oxford and one guy from sade i've told them like you should try it because yeah. uh it was such a relief so i was basically running around to get my loans and stuff back in india and in India, the interest rates were pretty high and uh, it was a mess. Like uh, I had a property where, using which I had to take the loan. Then it was an endless loop and there was a lot of bureaucracy in getting things done. And specifically considering the fact that I was not there in India. And with Prodigy, it was a very straightforward affair. So and they were, the staff were very, very supportive and they were very clear on what you want. Everything was online, so they say that these are the documents that you need, and you get those documents, and you're up and running. And one of the best things is that what you're hedging is not a property or a fixed deposit; it is your future. It's the MBA that you're hedging against. So I think that's a bigger hedge than probably a, a, an apartment. Yeah, what was your yeah. potential, right? Yeah, that's the. I mean, that's the whole hard work and whole uh, motivation for doing an MBA, right? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're hedging your future, but it's totally worth it. Like, it was pretty smooth. They transferred. I mean, it was smooth. It was very good. It was a very nice experience. Yeah, you know, and how did you find them while you were doing this uh, loan search? I mean, because it's in, you're in India. I mean, how how did mm-hmm. how did you find them? Okay, so I knew about Prodigy before itself when I was evaluating some of the schools. Then, uh, then I came to know that they are coming to SSC as well. So I was just following up with the academics team to figure out when Prodigy's, the, the uh, what do you call the contract with HUC is getting finalized. And the moment it got done, then I applied. Hmm. And then after applying, it was just like, what, a matter of a week or two before everything was cleared? I think it was uh, probably two to three weeks, yeah. I, I don't remember the exact days, but it was just two to three weeks. I had to just uh, sort out a couple of documentations. That's about it. But nothing major. It was pretty smooth. Nice, nice. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing the best I can as well to promote Prodigy Finance because I think what they're doing is amazing, and uh, it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just they're helping students achieve their dreams, um, and getting through all the red tape that banks have to, you know, have to put you through. And uh, also, I'm, I'm, I'm organizing their event here in Sao Paulo, Brazil, you know, in a couple of weeks. Oh, they're wonderful. Com- yeah, they're coming down wonderful. here to, uh, to promote their, their services to all the prospects here. Wow. I think for develop- people from developing countries, Prodigy is like the way to go forward because, I mean, I've also seen a lot of people who kind of struggle to get those funds. Like, it's, it's not a small amount that we are talking about when we are planning to do an to a B school, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's a lot of money, and specifically for people coming from developing countries, it's really really huge. It is larger than the actual amount. So, Prodigy is kind of a blessing in disguise. Yes, I would say. Oh yeah, it's such a blessing. It's a blessing in disguise is trying to come out there and and and, and gain gain exposure. And I think the more students uh, can see this, the benefits of Prodigy Finance. We get to eliminate that from the reasons why not to be able to do an MBA. I mean, they're, usually it's either it's too hard of a process or they got rejected from the school or they got accepted and they don't have enough money to pay for it. Exactly. They allow. Exactly. This, yeah. You get to eliminate that from the reasons from from that obstacle, you know. True. And also you get to, you know, you get to meet with uh you know, you don't have to go through all the difficult processes of, of you know, collateral or having a, a co-signer and stuff. So true. that's good. It's good. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, what is it like? What, 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 
what's in your future? I mean, what are what's next for you after your MBA? I know you're still halfway through there, but you know, what do you plan on doing? You know, as you go uh, after you graduate. Uh, well, I want to be back in the industry. I mean, right now I am in the industry with Amazon. And uh, yeah, I want to look out for job opportunities in the industry, which will specifically some MDP programs. So if Amazon, if I'm able to convert with Amazon, probably with Amazon, or I will also look out for other MDP, MDP programs, which is available in the market and then take it up from there. Hmm. Hmm. Nice. Do you plan on going back to India or something? Uh, not to India at the moment. I okay from a location perspective. I am a very open person. I want to explore as many places as possible. So I've spent quite a bit of my time in India and in the Middle East. So those are two options which I'm not considering at this point in time. Okay. I would uh, be open for uh, North America or Europe, and I would want to get into a job which is which would give me the leverage to shift my base probably once in three to four years oh, I so see, i want to i want to move around i want to explore new places i want to meet with new people i want to get exposed to new processes new challenges i think those things will help me grow as an individual more and probably as a future leader yeah 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 any plans on coming down to south america or brazil in the future Maybe i just am to visit totally to open yeah uh to Brazil, yeah, most likely yes. Like I've got some couple of really really good friends from Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, so I would definitely be visiting some of those countries sooner. Awesome, man! Future plans. Well, you need to make sure you let me know if you come down to Brazil so we can meet up for coffee. Definitely yes. Are you sure just coffee? <laughs> just co oh no no no! I mean, it, I mean if it, we can we can drink anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you heard? Maybe some caipiranas. <laughs> caipiranas, yeah, of course, man. You know, it's, yes. <laughs> and, and especially like on the weekday, on on you know, you can, this is the greatest thing about like, for example, Brazil. In my opinion, on a weekday, mm -hmm. Wednesdays, lunchtime is feijoada, which is like mm -hmm. a, a a bean and pork stew. And it's mm -hmm. it's custom. I mean, it's 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 one of those times where you can have a caipirinha on a workday. At lunch, while you have oh, like really? workers around you, yeah, and it's totally acceptable. I mean, it's it's just part of a custom. I mean, Interesting. You, you, yeah, I mean, Interesting. it's still not it's still not. I mean, although it's it's permissible, it's not always mm -hmm. you know it's not always best practice. But you have that mm -hmm. option. So I mean, I am totally up for whether we drink coffee or caipirinha or both. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should let me know when you're coming down here, though, Subu. Sure, sure. <laughs> All, All right. right. <laughs> well, so okay. my, my, my final question before we wrap this up is what are your final pieces of advice for our listeners? I mean, what would you tell our listeners who are right now going through the application process? You know, what can you tell them from somebody who's made it into an MBA? Okay. Uh, main thing, an MBA program is what you make out of it. So... It's a lot of opportunities in front of you, and it depends on how much of effort you put in to learn and to embrace the program as such. So nobody is going to feed you with anything, so it's totally up to you. So enjoy the experience, live it, don't take too much of load on like purely on the grades part. Yes, grades are very, very important, but an MBA experience is much, much more than pure grades alone. It's the entire package. So that's one experience that you have to enjoy so have fun enjoy work hard have fun and party <laughs> work hard have fun and party but yes you are absolutely co correct enjoy the journey even the hard parts because that all all of that builds the character you know that that you develop throughout the mba as well and that's going to go with true. you for the rest of your life yeah true that Subu, man, thank you so much again for for allowing us a little bit of your precious time uh, uh, for this interview. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure indeed. Yeah, and uh, and it was great talking to you. It was great talking to you as well, Subu. And uh, you know, I hope you really get the most out of your internship at Amazon. And you know, may your second year at HEC Paris be as amazing as your first. Thank you so much. All right, folks, there you have it. Yet another episode from the NBA Wire. This is Mateo Chang. Thanks for listening. We're signing off. Catch you next time. Yes.
Thanks for tuning into the MBA Wire. Would you like to know more? Visit us online at the mbawire.com today and leave your questions and feedback. While you're there, sign up for an exclusive free audio series to help you strengthen your MBA interview. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on the MBA Wire. MBA Wire.